All right, good evening. We are live. <clears throat> good evening, ladies and gentlemen and uh, constituents. Thank you so much for joining us here for the final, in the current series anyway, of virtual town hall meetings here with Delegate Heather Bagnall. It's wonderful to have you all with us and thank you for joining us to talk about education. Uh, a topic very close to our hearts uh, as educators ourselves. Uh, it is wonderful to have you all here with us. Just a couple of uh, little short pieces of housekeeping and then I will uh, pass the, uh, the mic to the uh, delegate uh, who will be probably much more interesting than me. Uh, so participants uh, will not be able to uh, begin their video or unmute themselves, but you can of course post questions to any of our candidates, uh, to any of our uh, uh, people on the, uh, who, are, who are joining us um, in the chat. And uh, so if you have a question, please just write question in the chat followed by the question itself. And we will try to get through as many of them as possible. Uh, you can also, of course, watch this and I, and many people are on our YouTube channel as we broadcast live. And you will also be able to find the recording of this meeting there at a later date, should you wish to uh, watch it again or to share it with any of your friends or colleagues. Uh, other than that, I will pass uh, the microphone over to uh, the lady of the evening, uh, Delegate Heather back now. Well, thank you once again for joining us tonight for this sixth and final of our 2022 legislative session virtual town hall series. I'm Heather Bagnall, your delegate in District 33. First, wanted to thank you all once again for your continued commitment to our community as we experience this, this latest surge of COVID. As we transition from the pandemic to endemic, I know many of us have gained, you know, gained a bit of relief as the vaccine was approved for our under five population. But as we're seeing a relaxing of restrictions, I, I wanna thank you once again for taking common sense actions which keep our community safe, our businesses open, our children in our school buildings uh, and our live arts alive. I know how hard it has been for our educators and administration to pivot throughout the pandemic and, and we are all still learning. Although we will be primarily discussing the blueprint tonight, where we are with, um, where we are with implementation, where we need to look, we cannot talk about education without acknowledging the realities of the impact, not only of COVID and the transition from virtual to hybrid to fully in-person learning, but also the challenges in ensuring our youth are ready to learn and the intersection of our social safety nets on their learning readiness as well as the impact of the national landscape and current trends in education. I am honored tonight uh, by, to have experts in the fields of education. Dr. Joanna Tobin, who is the president of the Anne Arundel County uh, Board of Education, is a 20 year um, uh, educator in, in experience in education governance, oversight for K through 12 level. She teaches at, um, at the college and continuing education level. Um, she's also been a, a community volunteer, um, worked with private school boards. Um, she's, she's been the chair of the Anne Arundel County uh, Citizens Advisory Committee on Recycling long before she even ran for, um, for school board. And, um, and we are also joined by uh, the president of the Maryland State Board of Education, uh, Mr. Clarence C. Crawford, who is a longtime uh, public servant. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to subscribe to my social media. I primarily use Facebook and Twitter for immediate information and so as not to clog up your inboxes, but I do send updates on events and issues within the community. Thank you all for being here and for your help and your advocacy throughout the session. I especially want to thank our congressional partners who have been working side by side with us uh, throughout the entire pandemic and, and, and helped us with, with the necessary funding to, uh, to make sure that, that we could continue to do our, our work. As always, I'm going to work to keep this call to an hour to respect your time and because I know we are all a little zoomed out. So I'll attempt to answer all questions, but if we can't get to your question on the call, we will circle back with you and make sure you have answers. If you have a question and have not submitted it in advance, please feel free to put your question in the chat. I also wanna thank my chief of staff, Caroline Hecker and Luke Tudball who consistently work behind the scenes to make me look 
much more tech savvy than I am and always on top of every issue. With that, I want to just welcome President Crawford and say thank you so much for being here. We're so excited about being at this point where we can finally look at, um, at the policy and the implementation of, of this, this, this world-class 21st century globally competitive uh, education system. So welcome. Yes, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Delegate Bagnall, uh, for this opportunity. I want to see my, good to see my good friend, Dr. Tobin here as well. I serve, my name is Clarence Crawford and I serve as the president of state board, as you mentioned. Um, the timing is great. Uh, the state board a couple of months ago uh, passed a resolution that really said that we are committed to uh, transformative education for our children. We wanted to, while, as you said, the pandemic, we're still dealing with effects of COVID, but we just felt that it was time now to start to move on. We've got to move on, got to move on and do this. Uh, we're just excited about this opportunity. Um, we're serving as the state board and the department of the state department of education are serving as process owners in the development of a strategic plan. So we're the process owners, we're managing the process, but the true owners of the plan are the citizens of the state of Maryland. We've started to collect some survey results and I'll share some with you, but one I wanna share right now is that nearly 86% of all Marylanders have said that having a quality public uh, school system is extremely important to Maryland's success as a state. And we take that very seriously. We're very much interested in transformation. We see the strategic plan as the implementation plan for the blueprint, as well as other important uh, related education matters. Uh, we launched a statewide survey. We, as of the end of June, we had over 23,000 responses. The number one response by all sectors, whether you look at race, uh, educators, students, business community, uh, parents, guardians, the number one thing that Marylanders said that we must do is we must improve reading and writing in the early grades across all of the sectors. And in Anne Arundel County, um, again, the number one item was reading, improving reading and writing in the early grades, improving math and science skills, developing excellent teachers, improving thinking, problem solving and collaborative skills and improving social, emotional and mental health supports. I think that when the story is finally written about COVID, the, the loss of life has been tragic, no doubt. But I believe that the real story is gonna be the impact, the social, emotional impact of COVID has had on our population at all, at all age levels. You know, we've completed uh, 17 roundtables. Dr. Tobin and I participated in one last week. We've got another one next week and a couple more. Uh, so we have uh, met with 232 participants. We participated in 23 listening sessions with uh, 1,500 participants. Our superintendent, Superintendent Chaudhary, has shadowed a student in every school district and met with the superintendents. Um, and like uh, your experience, Dr. Tobin, uh, when we were in the process of, of searching for a superintendent, we were pleasantly uh, surprised that our top candidates, all of them were familiar with the blueprint and saw the blueprint as a clear indication of Maryland's commitment to improved education. So that it's a, it was a great uh, magnet. It drew some incredibly, uh, capable people. As you know, the blueprint is, is a wonderful document. It's a wonderful piece of legislation. It increases funding uh, 3.8 billion over 10 years. Um, the blueprint provides the foundation to elevate every child and to reach the promise. We're excited about that. You know, we have to remember that we talk about workforce and improving workforce and like really what we're talking about. We're talking about children. We're talking about it, we can get it right. Children will leave our system 
and become highly productive adults. They will lead families. So we're talking about changing, changing the trajectory for children, for people in our state. And as we'll talk to the business community, they're excited about it because the stronger the educational system, the easier it is to attract and maintain leading businesses. And as you know, the blueprint has five components, early childhood education, high quality and diverse teachers and leaders, uh, college and career readiness, and more resources for all students and the governance. I'm happy to say that, you know, we've been working very collaboratively with the uh, AIB. Uh, both organizations are working very hard to minimize bureaucracy and to figure out how we can work together to improve educational outcomes for our children. So I'm excited about that. They're very much interested in that. And we have ongoing conversations with them and I'm excited about where we are. We've already started to see some good improvements. We've provided uh, preliminary guidance on implementing pre-K and early childhood education initiatives. We have MOUs with school districts and with private providers. We supported the implementation of the $10,000 uh, salary increase for the national certification. You know, we've also started conversations with the principals uh, because my experience, I'm, I'm more from government and business and my experience says that we've got to have highly qualified teachers, no doubt. But if we don't get the educational leaders on the ground, those, those principals and, and, and assistant principals engaged and support them as well, um, we're not going to realize the goals that we have. So we've commissioned studies that look at a academic alignment. And we've started a pilot implementation of the expert panels. I just want to just say a little bit about the task ahead of us. I think the blueprint was great. I think what we're working on with the strategy is great, but we need to be clear eyed about what we're about to do. We are undertaking a huge, huge initiative that will span 10 years. The good news is that we're gonna see improvements throughout the year, so we don't have to wait till year 10 to see improvements. They're gonna be coming online. But we also have to recognize that most transformative initiatives, whether they're run by the government or by the private sector, fail to realize their promise. We are firmly committed, and we believe the state is firmly committed to being up to this challenge. Our North Star is improving, uh, providing transformative educational opportunities for our students. The second thing that we're doing is we're building strong coalitions. As Dr. Tobin said, we're reaching out to parents and guardians and educators, elected officials, local boards, superintendents, unions, business community, AIB, because this initiative cannot be done out of Baltimore by itself. We have to engage our partners and they have to feel ownership and, and engagement. And the, the final thing that we're really gonna be focusing on is faithful implementation. We've gotta be able to implement this over an extended period of time. And I believe that we're up to it. I believe that we can pull this off. I'm excited about it. Our board is excited. And uh, again, Delegate, I appreciate the opportunity to come and to be able to spend a few minutes with you this evening and the citizens of Anne Arundel County. In fact, we used to live in Anne Arundel County in the early, in the 80s. We lived off of Johns Hopkins, uh, said Johns Hopkins Drive, a lane in uh, Crofton. And our daughter graduated from uh, Arundel High in the early 90s. Well, thank you so much and, well, and welcome back. Welcome back to Anne Arundel. Um, and, I, and I really appreciate, I appreciate so much what you said, because I, I think, you know, it can, it can, be such a daunting task. I mean, it's just a daunting task in, in passing comprehensive legislation. I mean, this was, this was, you know, a multi-years effort just in making sure we were speaking to the right people that we had the, you know, that we had um, the, 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 the correct expertise on, on the, on the commission that was even working on the, the, the policy recommendations before we even had a bill. And even then, um, I remember when we were in, uh, we were in, in process 
and we had Dr. Kerwin in front of us and, um, and somebody asked the question about mental health and re- mental health resources. And they said, don't we need more mental health resources? And he said, well, yes, yes, we do. And they said, well, what, what does that look like? And he said, well, we don't know. We were not charged with that for educators. Um, so, so, you know, uh, that, that health piece was, was the augmentation, you know, to your point, that mental health piece yeah. was already the augmentation that we were looking at before the pandemic hit. Absolutely. And I think it's, um, it's become so timely uh, given, given the last two and a half to, to three years um, that, that we were already sort of looking at this. And, um, and to your point, you know, this is a 10 year process and we're, we're actually in going into year three. Um, and so, so it's, uh, I think it's, it's important that, that, that we have those, you know, the management of our expectations, but always to your point with that, um, with that, that guiding, that guiding star of, 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 of where we want to, where we want to, to land. Um, Absolutely. And, um, and I, and, and you've given me a great parallel uh, to, to segue to Dr. Tobin, because to your point, we did, um, we did have a statewide effort to, uh, to recruit a new superintendent for the Maryland State uh, Board of Education. But then we also had, for the county, we had a, 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 a Herculean effort uh, to to recruit a um, a superintendent in in the midst of um, in the midst of 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 the, the the pandemic transition from you know virtual to hybrid to in person to masking to not masking to um, and so um, what did that look like, Doctor Tobin? And welcome and thank you for being here. <laughs> yes. Yes, Dr. Tobin, what did that look like? <laughs> what did that look like? Uh, well, the first thing is I'm looking at this going, have I only been president for six months? Because it feels like <laughs> it's been, it's been a, a, a long period. Well, I have to tell you, and I was sharing this with, uh, with Delegate Bagnall and uh, President Crawford before we began, and President Crawford alluded to it, that in fact, our job was made easier by the existence of the blueprint and the clear commitment that our state and our county has uh, to education. And, and, you know, I knew, quite frankly, because I've been involved in this work uh, prior to ever imagining I would run for the Board of Education, you know, what great uh, leaders were out there and, and how attractive a district this is, um, people forget we are the 37th largest school district in the country, and there are over 4,000 school districts in the country, right? So, so right there, I think those of us who are sort of inside Anne Arundel County forget that this is a behemoth of a district by, by standards. Our, our small, I believe our smallest district in Maryland, Kent County, is still bigger than most districts in this country, and that's about 2,000 students. So people forget how small uh, most districts are. So this is a huge opportunity. And we were very fortunate to have incredible um, applicants. And and, uh, I'm happy to say we're able to select our unanimous choice, our unanimous first choice of Dr. Mark Bedell, who is coming to us from Kansas City and a remarkable record of achievement. Prior to that, he was in Baltimore County and lived in Anne Arundel County at that time. So he's coming home um, and uh, he will be on the ground on August 8th. Uh, Currently, uh, Ms. Monique Jackson is our acting superintendent, uh, one of our our, our actually our deputy uh, superintendents who has taken over that role. So we're delighted with that. Um, and I will tell you the other thing about uh, Dr. Bedell in light of Blueprint that I think also made him one of the many things that made him such a great match. His own teaching background is in elementary education. 
And that's really important because one of the most critical things sort of in the broad brush, in my view, about Blueprint is the extent to which it puts huge emphasis on early childhood and early elementary. Um, in light of exactly what President Crawford referred to, which is we know that literacy, basic math skills, all of that happens early. And it, sure, you can intervene later, but that's a, that's a much more complicated and frankly, less successful process on the whole than getting it right from the get-go. And so, you know, we are, I'm thrilled, we're thrilled, A, to have an incredible educator like Dr. Bedell coming on at the helm, um, who, you know, as you may know, uh, he, he took over the Kansas City Schools District six years ago. They had not been accredited in decades under his leadership in five years, they were accredited, which nobody thought would happen. He also brought the business community back to Kansas City. He's incredibly adept at making those connections, which again, Blueprint pushes us to that, right, rightly so in my view, because if we really are going to do what Blueprint is aimed at, and I, I had the great fortune, bef again, before I ran for the board, before I got on the board, to be intimately familiar with the research of Mark Tucker, a lot, which is really the ground for a lot of Blueprint, and of having had conversations with Mark about this, having worked with other leaders in education who were similarly involved in that kind of research. You know, the big aim of this is exactly what President Crawford was alluding to. And I used to put it this way when I was running for the board, and I still talk about it this way. The purpose of education is to enable young people to develop into fulfilled, productive human beings, right? That's the measure of a good education. It's not a checking the box thing. That is the measure. So if we're really going to aim at that, all the things that are being put in place from the early childhood all the way through to, you know, what some people refer to as blowing up high school, right? Really looking at high school in a very different way as, as real preparation for coming out of high school, ready to start a job, start a career, head to college, whatever it is that student feels to be their, their path that fits them, they're ready to pursue that path. We're not picking winners and losers. We're not saying, oh, well, if you do well, you're on the college path, otherwise not so great. Everybody, everybody should be able to find the path that works for them be prepared for that path. And by the way, my own view is, you know, a young person who comes out of high school and says, I want to, to go ahead in that career right now, whether it's say HVAC or something like that. And then 10 years later says, yeah, I'd like to go to college and get a college degree. They should have had the preparation in high school that will enable them to do that. And so if we're doing our job, that, that will be the, what, students are able to have coming out of our schools. And I think uh, the broad structure that we've been given and that the state is overseeing in, in Blueprint enables us to do this. And I think the work that we're doing on the ground here in Anne Arundel County is, is working hand in hand with that. I should say our teacher of the year this year is an amazing man, first time ever. One of our teachers out of our Centers for Applied Technology North, who's, who actually has been teaching HVAC and various things associated to it for 15 years, was a career changer, had a career before that, um, and is truly one of our most extraordinary teachers. And I think it's just an example of the fact that, you know, education really needs to be understood in this broad sense. Um, we are, as President Crawford alluded to, any big piece of legislation like this 
once it starts rolling out, now we need to see what implementation is going to look like. Now we tweak where we need to tweak. And I'm fortunate, in addition to my position as president of the Board of Anne Arundel County Education, I'm also on the um, Blueprint Implementation Committee for the Maryland Association of Boards of Education, where we are sort of gathering from all the districts around the state what, you know, what's working for them, what might not be working for them. And so we're working on those things. Uh, President Crawford's aware of this. I'm sure Delegate Bagnell is as well. We're, try we're now, one of the things that I think we really have realized we need to work on is making sure that the structure for the universal three and four-year-old pre-K is attractive to, and, and frankly, possible for private daycare providers and private pre-K providers. Um, and I know having chaired, previously chaired the board of a Montessori school that was a private school, what that looks like. And so we're working with the state to, to begin to, to get things so that that will work a little better. Um, that's just one example of a couple of the things. We are incredibly fortunate in this county right now in, in the budgetary support we are getting from our county executive and our county council. Um, because there is, uh, as most people who have been following this, I think, are aware, the requirements of Blueprint are that at a certain point, 20, I believe it's 26, we have to have teachers starting salaries at 60K, which is fabulous. But it means we have to play catch up, right? We have to play catch up. And you can't play catch up all in one year. You've got to be able to have a certain percentage, a certain percentage, a certain percentage every year so that you hit that point and you're not falling off a, a funding cliff. Um, and so we, our superintendent, our just previous superintendent presented what many people thought was an extraordinary large budget this year, but was a budget that truly reflected our needs. And we are profoundly grateful that our county executive and uh, the overwhelming majority of our county council voted for it, funded uh, to a much higher level than, than we've ever seen our needs, including for the first time in anybody's memory, 100% funding of our capital budget, which was extraordinary. Um, because COVID has also taught us, and I should preface this by saying, the Anne Arundel County school system has the fifth oldest fleet of buildings in the state. So we have a lot of uh, catch up to do. And COVID taught us that things like ventilation and, and air circulation and so on, things have to be um, maintained and, and modernized uh, as quickly as possible to ensure that we can pivot when we need to. So we're very fortunate that we have a county, uh, you know, a, a local funding authority in our county council that has supported us along with our county executive. And, uh, and this is an extraordinary time. I mean, we're doing all of this while we are struggling with a national transportation crisis, you know, a bus driver crisis, and, um, and frankly, a teaching shortage. And uh, Blueprint is helpful with the teaching shortage because we are going to have the kind of resources for teachers that we, you know, we should have, uh, we should always have had, um, in my view. But on the other hand, those tweaks we now have to work out and make sure that all categories of teachers are covered, all categories of counselors are covered and so on. And that's work that we're partnering with the state and the state both the MSDE, the state board, and AIB are great partners in that. And, and we're, you know, we're just incredibly fortunate to be in this, in this time right now. Um, and so, you know, that's that's the great news. I should also say we have as our blueprint coordinator in ACPS, Dr. Shannon Pugh, who is extraordinarily well-versed in the work of Blueprint, which as we know is an, 
a very complicated piece of legislation. We also have Matt Stansky, who's overseeing our, the financial end of it. And I think both of them have come to be really known as experts in the state among the districts. And so we're very lucky that we have that expertise on our staff. Um, so with that, I think, you know, we continue to work through the details, but the big picture is wonderful. And like President Crawford, I think this is an incredibly exciting initiative. It's an exciting time. And if I may say, finally, I've always believed that children watch the adults around them. They don't do what we say, they do what we do. And if we take on hard things that we know to be the right things and we stick with them, even when they're hard, and we show our children that they are important, their education is important, we are doing this hard work, spending a lot of money because they matter, their future matters. I think that is one of the most powerful lessons young people can learn. So I'm just incredibly grateful to the state legislature and to Delegate Bagnell and to you, President Crawford, for your leadership and Superintendent Chari for his leadership on this because um, speaking as, as the president of one local board, I'm just thrilled to be a part of Maryland education at this, at this time. So thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. And, and I, I think there are some really great points because I there's so many moving parts with this. And I think sometimes it's it's hard to sort of wrap our heads around um, the, the 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 state piece, the, the county piece, the local piece. Um, and and that there's there's the policy, there's the funding, there's the implementation, there's the oversight, and then there's this nebulous piece that I think um, there's confusion about, which is the actual curriculum. Mm -hmm. And curriculum isn't part of the blueprint. Um, and I think there's, there's often confusion about that. Um, and when we're talking about all these moving parts, uh, President Crawford, you made a great point about um, the essential nature of principals and assistant principals in these schools, because they, they really do sort of create the culture of that school. And so much of what we're trying to do with the blueprint is make sure that regardless of the school, regardless of your zip code, that you are getting access to an equal and meaningful education. Um, and that those, those dollars, those dollars that, that Dr. Tobin, that you spoke about, and it, and it is, it is uh, I believe 50% of, of our Anne Arundel County budget is education. 51. 51. <laughs> we're, we're data people, I know. Yeah, but, I'm but, reminded but, of it daily, yes. <laughs> but, but even before the blueprint, um, the average return on investment for education is $7 to each dollar spent. So um, it, it is a good sound investment, you know, to, to, to President Crawford's point, um, you know, this is this is investing in our business community. This is investing in our real estate. This is investing um, in the future of our state. And most importantly, to your point, Dr. Tobin, it's investing in our young people and their future. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what is a, a more worthy investment um, for our for our state dollars than mm -hmm. than than you know our future citizens. Um, so I want to circle back a little bit because we did talk about that early uh, that early childhood education piece, and I know that that we spent a lot of time um, talking about that and what you know what that implementation would look like because we knew at the state level we knew uh, to, to your point that we were going to have to find a way to work with um, with private uh, childcare and and. Um, and, and child and early childhood education because we didn't have the physical space 
uh, to accommodate um, universal pre-K. But that early childhood education is so essential because that really is when our young people are learning how to learn. Um, and, and, and that's, I, I think that's become sort of a, a, a national effort where, you know, we're, we're sort of leading uh, the charge, but, uh, but I, I, I think that that is, that is a national effort. We've even heard uh, President Biden speak to, um, to uh, prioritizing um, early childhood education, prioritizing universal pre-K. Um, and, and President Crawford, you spoke a little bit about it, um, you know, what the state is doing but Dr. Tobin, I, I know, you know, the rubber meets the road when we get down to the county level, trying to, to, uh, to find how we actually accommodate um, such, a large, uh, uh, such a large school district as, as we have. Um, so can you speak a little bit to, to what that process looks like? Well, so for now, a couple of years, um, our staff, of course, we, we'd always worked with all the childcare providers and pre-K providers around the county. We're familiar with them. Uh, and we have been reaching out to them, working with them to encourage them to begin to get ready to participate in this. Um, and we've had, out of a hundred or so we work with, one who was prepared to, to do this because the requirements that are in place are really requirements that fit public institutions, right? I mean, private uh, early childhood education systems, you know, have their own uh, salary levels. They have other things that they do. Some of them are held in churches. Some of them are held in temples. I mean, there's lots of different pieces that make it a little complicated for private providers. And so that's when we started reaching out to the state um, to begin to explore, you know, how can we loosen some of this up here to give more leeway to the private providers to be able to continue the model that they work on. I mean, you know, I, again, I had the experience of chairing the board of a Montessori school that served children from 18 months to 15 years old. And so the very youngest, you know, what we called our toddler community, which was a year and a half to two and a half. And then from there, the, the what the Montessori term primary is, which goes through about age five to six, depending. Um, you know, they just have a very different structure in terms of how they pay uh, their, their, uh, their, as they're called, their directresses or directors and the number of kids in a classroom and the way the classroom is set up and so on. And frankly, I looked at the blueprint structure and I knew that a school like that couldn't participate. So we have been working with the state. We continue to work with our local providers uh, to see, you know, what they need next. Uh, I think their void, President Crawford can, can maybe attest to this, that, you know, I think the AIB is well aware that this is something that we've got to work on. And I think uh, the state legislature is aware that this is something we're going to have to work on. And, you know, that's how it's going to get done, quite frankly, because we, we're just going to have to partner uh, with one another, we continue to do all the work we can to make it as attractive as possible to our private providers. So I think we're getting a little more interest, but part of that is the promise that we will work with the state to, to open up some of those requirements a little bit more. So, you know, it's an ongoing conversation and that's what these things have to be. Um, so that we, cause we, we know where we all wanna get eventually. Um, and so, and, and, you know, if I may just add this quickly, it's a little off your question, delegate, but I think it's, it's related in a, in a way. I, there's something I didn't mention earlier that I think the blueprint really uh, is going to push districts to, which I think is a good thing, is broadly speaking, the structure of bargaining with our units 
because the blueprint sort of sets these big goals, the, the old positional bargaining structure isn't going to continue to work, I believe, in quite the same way. I think we're going to have to have a more collective structure for bargaining with an eye to these goals, right? We're going to have to have both the administrators and the teachers bargaining units in the room and sort of say, look, how do we, how do we all get here, right? Rather than the kind of siloed bargaining that's happened. But if I may say so, I think that's part of the aim of Blueprint is to get away from silos in a lot of ways, because that's been a bit of a problem with, uh, you know, with public institutions in general, certainly public education as one of those. And so I think, again, that's a good thing, but we're all going to have to find our way through that a little more um, and, and get used to working that way. Um, and I think it will all benefit our, our students in the long run. So we're beginning to address that too with our bargaining units, sort of how, how are we gonna do this? So I think um, you know a lot of this is just an ongoing conversation as we see what needs to happen to, to bring these goals to fruition. President Crawford, I saw I saw your eyes light up. <laughs> I saw your eyes light up when we were talking I, about that. Yeah, I agree with uh, Dr. Tobin. This is uh, this is this is the challenge of, of that we had is that we we have a very good starting point with the blueprint and what we're going to do in the strategy, but it's really going to involve a lot of work and and being flexible. On the uh, the thing we one of the things we have to remember about the um, private uh, 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 pre-K providers is these are small businesses. Yeah. So at the end of the day, they have to make payroll. Yeah. They have to manage their costs. They have to uh, adhere to the uh, post COVID standards. Um, so we're working with them. We, we provide uh, orientations, helping them from a small business standpoint. We do a lot of workshops. We're working with them to try to find ways to streamline processes, to speed up payments. Um, we met with um, uh, some of the providers at one of our state board meetings and they were just saying, you know, they're, they're in full support of the concept of, uh, of the increasing the educational levels of the providers. They said, you know, I'm on a business. I'm there 10 hours a day, sometimes 12 hours a day. When I get off, I have a family. And yes, I want to, to increase my educational level, but we need to also recognize I'm also a small business person with a family trying to make ends meet. So I think as we work through those issues, one of the things I would like to just highlight is, um, Delegate, you mentioned curriculum. And one of the things I would just like to highlight is the, um, the LEADS grant initiative that uh, the department just uh, made some awards on. What was interesting about it, it focuses on early literacy and one of the things that we have been talking to the department and we're very pleased with the superintendent is that we're looking at different ways to engage the local systems. Yes, we have to issue regulations. You have to have regulations, I got that. And, but to get where we need to go, we need to be thinking more in terms of incentives and influence. And one of the things that I like about the LEADS initiative is that in co cooperation with the local systems, we identified um, proven um, methodologies for teaching um, uh, reading. The local systems can then pick from those methodologies that work. So we're not interfering with the local systems and their ability to, to select curriculum, but we're helping to steer the local systems to methodologies that work. One of the things that have fascinated me since I've been on the board and I'm new to education is people kept saying, well, we're, we're following these proven 
uh, approaches. And I'm saying, okay, if we're following improvement approaches, how come nothing's working? I mean, you know, <laughs> why don't we see real change? So what we're, what I'm, I'm pleased with is that we had 22 of the 24 school systems receive grants. And instead of trying to make people do things, we're trying to figure out ways to incentivize. We're looking also for opportunities where we can cut back on regulation, or we can provide more flexibility. We also wanna come back to Annapolis with some ideas or some things that maybe some reports and requirements that we have on the department or on the local systems. Maybe it's time to revisit some of that. So we're looking at are there flexibilities? So if, you, if, you, if you're moving out smartly, if you're doing the right kinds of things in your system, um, are there some flexibilities that you should be able to have? So we're open to that and uh, really looking at how we can really engage people and try to do it more from a positive standpoint than from uh, beating people over the head with a regulation. So. That's a couple of things I just wanted to highlight there. And, and I, I greatly appreciate that. Um, you know, Dr. Tobin knows well that I have a mission of unsiloing government because um, because I because I because I think you know I think we are are more effective when we are cooperative. And I think we saw that, you know, in stark in stark reality during the pandemic. Um, but it's also, I think, it, I think in terms of education, that is where education is moving, is, 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 is this team uh, model that doesn't work when we're, when we're siloed because, um, you know, because the, the team isn't working cooperatively, they're not communicating cooperatively. And I think to Dr. Tobin's point, they're also not being um, compensated cooperatively. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think that flexibility is also what we saw we needed um, during the pandemic. Um, and I think there's, there's been a real, there's been a real push, you know, from even from the community and from the educational community um, to say we, even within, within the classroom needing enough flexibility to meet students where they are. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're seeing is that we sort of need to open that aperture and understand it's also about meeting school systems where they are um, and, and recognizing that, that, that they're going to need flexibility to, um, to adapt their own, um, you know, their own uh, districts to these policies. So it's, it's not about you know, a hard and fast rule or regulation so much as an overarching standard that we're trying to, to, uh -huh. to achieve. Yes. And I think we also saw, um, that there was um, a tension between childcare and education, um, where they they are they are not synonymous necessarily, but given the realities of of our workforce, they have become synonymous. Um, and and this segues into a, a question that we have actually in the chat because uh, drilling down to the local level and, and that question of, of flexibility, um, you know, Dr. Tobin, we spoke about this earlier, you know, we are in the realities right now of, of this national uh, transportation challenge. Mm -hmm. And at the local level, we're dealing not just with the transportation shortage and a potential teacher shortage, because we don't know what that's gonna look like. You know, we know we have some teachers looking at early retirement. We know that we have some teachers that are, are, are pivoting to another career, mm -hmm. but we also know that, that we are attracting teachers with this new initiative. Um, how that, um, that school start times change, because we've, we've been working for a number of years on, um, on uh, the, the new school start time, healthy school start times. Um, and we, uh, you know, we passed that bill. I know that we, we also had a daylight saving bill um, that I think I was one of three no votes because I knew that, that my county hated yep. that bill. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and so, so I, I think there's, there's a lot of concern, like how, you know, how is that, what is the potential impact uh, on families? How, how is the district preparing um, to support these students, these families? 
um, with these with these changes, especially if they have siblings that that are maybe going to be on a different a different schedule, mm -hmm. if they have uh, a a work schedule that will not accommodate a new start time, um, you know how are how are we preparing for that? And I know you've sp spoken at the board meetings, um, but. This is an op another opportunity to, uh, another, to, yes. to to speak to to speak to this because it, it is a very real local concern oh, and, and, big, we're, and we're hearing yeah. it as well. Oh yeah, no, it's a big concern. Um, uh, you know, probably one of the most far-reaching impacts anything has is changing the school hours, right? Uh, because it's not obviously start times change, then end times change as well. So it really is the whole structure. Uh, so, you know, just to reiterate what I'm sure people have heard me say and heard others say, and as you mentioned, De Delegate Bagnall, this has been going on for years, and the board voted on this in January 2021. So this initiative has been going on for a very long time at this point. Uh, but our current or, or the school hours that we've had up until the end of this last school year are not in line with what major medical authorities tell us our children need. Um, and that is the, the developmentally appropriate times for beginning and ending school. Uh, our high schools have been starting at 7.30 in the morning. Some of our elementary schools don't start till 9.45. Um, and that's been problematic on both ends. Uh, long before I was on the board, uh, the board was hearing testimony about this. We've continued to hear testimony. We have elementary and pre-K teachers who are waking children up to put them on the bus in the afternoon because school is going so much later than is appropriate for children that age. Similarly, we've been hearing, you know, high school teachers who literally hand out candy at 7.30 in the morning because that's the way to get kids awake for class. Um, not to mention, you know, the coffees this big that kids are bringing in to class. Um, and this is not, I, I think something that gets lost in the translation often is people sort of take it as, oh, well, it somehow would be better for kids if we move the start times. And essentially our start hours are pivoting around all high schools will start no later than 830, which is the minimum that the pediatricians tell us is the appropriate start time for high school. And uh, some elementary schools will start at eight, some at 8.30, middle schools are staying at nine, 9.15. So that's the structure that we will be moving to at the beginning of this year. Um, and I, as I said, people tend to hear it as, well, it would, it's sort of better for them if we do this. What they don't understand is what the physicians are telling us is what's, been happening up until now has been harming children. Um, it's really bad for them, for their emotional and intellectual development. Um, and so we're putting our children at a disadvantage by having the start times and the end times that we have had. The problem is, as you rightly mentioned, there, there's life that cycles around this, right? And so we have been partnering with the county in every way that we can to provide supports. We've had a, we had one uh, day care, child care fair. We're gonna have others. Uh, we've been putting out information on a regular basis. Um, but the fact remains that districts all over this country have changed to the times we're changing to and continue to operate within those times and provide everything that everybody needs. The daycare, the after school activities, the sports, the internships, all of those things. We are the third wealthiest county in what is by many measures, the wealthiest state in this country. We should be able to do that, quite frankly. We have legacy decisions that have been made we are a district that decided a long time ago that every athletic facility that was built would be shared between schools and recreation and parks. 
And therefore, we have these incredibly tight schedules. Other districts don't, do, don't have to do that. Howard County doesn't have to do that. PG County doesn't have to do that. I'll be blunt. We've saved a lot of money off the backs of our children by setting up the structures that we've had. And so we, as, a, as a, the governing body of an educational system, have to finally make our decisions on the basis of what is in the best interests of our children, of their physical well-being, their mental well-being, and their success. And moving these start times is necessary to do that. Now you add to the fact that the Surgeon General has de declared a crisis, a mental health crisis for our youth. Um, we have learning recovery that has to happen because of COVID, right? And the data are clear. One of the most immediate things we can do to address both of those issues is change these start times, quite frankly. Families talk about, you know, older siblings needing to take care of their younger siblings. We can't sacrifice that older sibling's education to that need. Right. That's as a school system, we can't we can't pivot everything around that. We have to for all the reasons we've just talk, been talking about the blueprint. Every student needs to have their education so that they are capable of leaving school and doing what they need to do. And this is especially true. These start times are especially important for our most vulnerable students who don't have a lot of structure at home, who don't have people enforcing early bedtimes, who don't have all of that. Now, the data are also clear that when you actually move these start times, kids do get more sleep. And, you know, people say, well, they're just going to stay up later. And the data show that, no, they get more sleep because the brain shifts. Little kids wake up early. Teenagers do not. And it's not because they're lazy. It's because their brains are set up in a different way. And they need to be able to be in a place where they can go into school and learn. And so that is why we're doing this. We're continuing. The, the start times are not changing the bus driver crisis. That's another crisis. And again, Calvert County is now paying their bus drivers $30 an hour. We are not able to compete with that at this point. So, you know, those are things that do cost money. But as you said, Delegate Bagnell, these are realities. And we have to recognize that our children, their education costs money. And, but the payoff, as you rightly said, is huge. And so we're going to get through this. We are going to be pumping out regular updates, make sure everybody knows where we are. Dr. Bedell is committed to over communicating on this. So there are no surprises and we will move into the next year and we will adjust to this because as I said earlier, young people need to see the adults around them doing hard things when those are the right things to do. So thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and thank you. And I, I, you know, I, I think, I think that's an important point. I mean, there's, there's, there's the need and then there's the reality. Um, and, and we have a great question in the chat and president Crawford, I'm going to turn to you. Um, because the question in the chat is, is there blueprint funding to support the additional childcare or transportation to include activity buses? But I think the broader question is how do we create the supports to accommodate the need? Mm -hmm. Because the need, the reality is that we are transitioning um, in, in, into a, you know, a new world in the midst of, of multiple crises. Um, and in some ways, pivoting during a crisis makes more sense than waiting and then having to pivot when things have settled down and then disrupting everything again 
it's kind of it kind of makes sense to move forward in disruption rather than wait to you know wait for a level and then disrupt again. But how do we create those supports? How do we how do we get from point A to point B with as minimal disruption as possible, recognizing the reality of 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 you know the the the, the driver shortage and the childcare shortage and and the fact that that parents not only need to work, but that for, for many parents, they're going back to a job that maybe they, they weren't able to, to have, and they're sort of already behind the eight ball on, on a lot of this. And our, our young people are also behind the eight ball in terms of, of, of some of that learning loss that, that we're, we're now playing catch up on. So I know it's a, it's a big question. <laughs> well, I would just say that, um, these are some of the areas where we're gonna to have to work to find solutions. As I mentioned with the, the childcare providers, these are small businesses. These are small business owners. And while the incentives are there to increase education, um, we may have to think differently about how we do that given the pressures that they're under. Um, I'm not quite as optimistic that we are going to be able to hire our way out of teacher shortages and bus driver shortages in the short term. So what we've started to do and we've been talking to MSD and the superintendent about is to begin to think about what are some short term, the next three to five year alternatives that we can do. Is, is there something while we maintain our standards, can we do something, have a little bit more flexibility with uh, conditional teachers or licensure or other kinds of requirements um, to get us through this period? Because they, what you're seeing worldwide is a, a worldwide shortage of workers. I was just talking to some friends in, uh, in the private sector where they can pay uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars and they can't find people. So they're just not there. So what we have to begin to think about then in this environment is how do we begin to do work differently? So the department is starting to look at that. We're looking, gonna be working with uh, PISTAB on that. Uh, coming back to the legislature, working with the local school systems to, to think differently about what do we do how do we get our classrooms covered? How do we provide quality education? Um, I think we've got a lot of money coming in. I think that's great. And I'm a fiscal conservative, so I'm a little concerned on one hand about the amount of dollars. On the other hand, my gut instinct says that in some areas like in with uh, pre-K and early childhood, there may not be enough money uh, when you look at um, what may be necessary to support some of the smaller uh, uh, school systems, moving to 60,000 uh, is probably a much greater challenge for them to be able to fund their portion of that. So we're going to have to really think this through. What we plan to do is uh, we're going to, in the fall, we're going to be releasing sort of the overall strategy for the strategic plan. But for the, then for the next four or five months or so, we're gonna be engaging the local systems, the superintendents, the boards, other stakeholders and thinking through, okay, what, how do we actually do this in real practical terms? When are we going to do it? And sort of what our combined roles will be. So be starting probably sometime in November running into early spring we're gonna have some really detailed conversations uh, to try to figure out, Marilyn, Marilyn, how do we do this? How do we do this for our children? How do we do this with the realities? Are there gonna be situations where we may need to come back to Annapolis for flexibility or whatever? And we're working with the, the AIB. But I, I think that it starts with that conversation. The other thing I'll just mention too, we started a conversation with the unions. And we said to them, look, there are gonna be a host of things we're gonna disagree about. Don't even worry about that. There are processes to deal with that. But can we agree upon a couple of things? 
educating our children, providing safe work environments for our teachers. So I know the superintendent meets with um, uh, MSCA monthly in a conversation because you have to start talking to people and you have to start talking to them before you get into tough. If you, the only time we talk is when there's a tough situation, Nothing, nothing's gonna work. But if we can start the conversation, so we're starting the conversation with them to begin to figure out, okay, let's, let's just figure, are there a couple of things that we could do that make sense for children? So we're trying to move in that direction. I think that will, hopefully that will flow down to the, to the local systems as we do this. Because again, our focus is on, we can't do this alone. Uh, Maryland will only be successful if we can figure out how to engage our key stakeholders and give them ownership ownership of this, that this is a, a Maryland plan. This is a Maryland strategy. This is not a, a state board or a state department. As Dr. Tobin knows, we don't, we don't, we don't implement education. We don't, we don't deliver education on the local level. So as we talk to this, the boards, um, one of the things we've asked, we had three questions when we talked to the boards. Number one, tell us how we're doing. Tell us the truth. We can handle it. We're big enough. Number two, tell us what we can do to help you be successful. What can we do? So we're making notes. Got one more session to go. And then the third thing we've asked is, we have to respect our roles and there's certain areas where we have to maintain independence, but are there some areas where we can work in partnership to make a difference for children? So I think a lot of it starts there to figure this out and then get people on board and we'll have to make some adjustments and we'll have to be flexible. But I think if we're smart about it and we stay focused and we don't get distracted and we stay focused on what is most important, educating our children, I think we can do it. The other thing I'll just mention is there was a report that I found, someone shared with me about a month ago, a 1916 report to the General Assembly on the state of Maryland education. I can send it to you. The shocking thing is that many of the issues they identified in 1916 are still with us today. Yep. <laughs> and our board, we've been talking about it, and I think our board is, is, is close to effectively just saying, we're gonna draw a line in the sand. The report on the 2022 state of Maryland is gonna be an entirely different one. 100 years from now, they're gonna be looking back saying, look what those crazy people did. So, so we, we're gonna we're going to really look at that and, and focus on how we can do it. And we, we have to come together as a community to do it. And, th and that's what we're trying to build. Thank you so much. And, and I, I realized that we're, we're already over time. I could talk with you all night about this, um, but I do wanna be respectful of your time. Um, so, so I'm going, I'm going to, 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 to pose one more question for, for each of you, uh, because it's, um, I think, I think it's, it's what we all want to know, you know, how, how do we as a community stay engaged, you know, where do, where do we um, go for our information? What do you need um, to be successful and, and how, how can we in the Maryland legislature partner um, to, to, to give you what you need. And uh, Dr. Tobin, I'll start with you at the count, at the, at the local level and then um, President Crawford, um, I'll, I'll give you final, final um, remarks, bite at the educational apple. Um, well, so first of all, engagement, engagement, engagement. Um, and a reminder that the Schools aren't just important for people who have children in the system. Absolutely. This is about our whole community, our whole future. Nothing is more critical. And now I'll say as somebody who's, you know, so I'm an old, my PhD is in political theory. I've spent decades thinking about, you know, how systems of government work. There is nothing more fundamental to a functioning democracy than a sound public education system. That's just how it is. That's the sine qua non. So 
I think it's a reminder that this matters to everyone. As a board, I mean, our local board, anybody at any time can send emails to all of us. If you go on the website, you know, aacps.org, there's a page that says board. You go there, you'll find all our emails, how to contact us. At any time, you can contact us. And we will do our best to respond. I will say this. Uh, none of us as board members have staff, right? So I read every email I get. I can't respond to everyone. I'll be honest with you. I do my level best, but I can't. But I read everything that's sent to me. So that's, that's the first thing. Um, and recognize that, you know, there are so many opportunities to volunteer in our schools, to participate with kids in all sorts of things. We welcome that, that our children are looking for that. So please be a part of that. You know, follow what the county council is doing. Advocate, advocate for what you care about. Advocate for budgets, advocate for all of those things. Because, you know, that's how we know that people are out there and are responding. Um, so there's there are all those opportunities to be a part of this, to have your voice heard. And I think that's the most, you know, really the most important thing is be engaged, pay attention, let your voice be heard, let us know what you think. We can't always do exactly what you might want us to do, but we need to have the conversation. And finally, to President Crawford's point, the vice president of our board, my dear friend and colleague, Robert Silkworth, who is a retired 49-year teacher in Anne Arundel County Schools, says all the time, education at the end of the day is about relationships. That's really what it's about. And so that goes for us on the board, that goes for teachers, that goes for children, that goes for parents. Um, and I just wanna commend uh, President Crawford for his work on the state board for modeling that really for the rest of us. I think that's been just a huge leap forward for us in Maryland and Superintendent Chowdhury is modeling the same thing. And I think that is incredibly important for all of us. Yes, we have our different areas, our different lanes, so to speak, and, and we all respect that. But those relationships matter and President Crawford's right. You don't wait till there's a problem to have the conversation. And a conversation isn't a one-time thing. It keeps going on. Um, and that's what you do. And so to the public, keep having the conversation with us. We will keep having the conversation with you. And obviously with the state board and all of our state partners, um, because we all have one goal, our kids. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Tobin. President Crawford. I agree with Dr. Tobin. Um, we have one priority that's, that's make a difference for our children. And um, we are very much open and encouraged. We're trying to improve our, one of the things we want to do is improve our website. It is not the best, <laughs> but we're working on that. So to make it a little bit easier to, to communicate and find things that's on our list of things to do. Um, we have a public comment period. Uh, people send us emails. Um, we're going to try to be very thoughtful in engaging the legislature. I'm hoping that this session we're going to come with some ideas about where we could benefit from some flexibility, where it would take some of the, the uh, it's important to have reporting. It's important to have accountability. I'm 100% on board with that. But sometimes what happens over time, as you know, the just requirements that were placed five years, 10, 15 years ago made sense then, may not make sense today. So I want to come and look at that. And I think just be open to us and the AIB and the local uh, boards being able to come in and to offer suggestions about how we can move forward. And it may require us to do things a little differently than what was initially anticipated, but as long as we're moving in the right direction, as long as we keep the focus on the children, I think we can do this. And it's, it's communications, it's absolutely right. It's this, it works when you talk, when you don't talk, 
all of this unravels almost overnight. Thank you so much. Thank you both so much for being here tonight, for having this conversation, um, for, for helping me feel more informed about where we are, where we need to go, how I can be a, a sound partner. And I would be remiss if I did not take the opportunity from Dr. Tobin, um, who talked about, you know, a core to a functioning democracy is a sound education to say that we have an opportunity to be involved in, in our functioning democracy because starting tomorrow, we have early voting uh, with primary day coming up July 19th. Of course, this year we have moved the primaries. Um, we all got a huge education on the census and on <laughs> redistricting and this whole process um, as, as we navigated it. Um, and, and to that end, I also wanna recognize a couple people who are on this call. Um, Carl Niemeyer is here. Uh, he's a, a candidate for County Council District 5. Sean Livingston is here, uh, County Council District 7 uh, candidate. Um, and I think all of that is important, an important segue because uh, uh, as, as, as all of our speakers have talked about, we all need to be working together um, in, in, in trying to make sure that we are creating the resources to, to, to meet the needs of, of our young people and make sure that we are really prioritizing uh, education for, for, for our Maryland students. So thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for, for being a part of this conversation. And I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to, to Luke to, to take, us, take us out. Well, thank you to all of our guests um, who have been joining us on YouTube and also here in the Zoom. Uh, that was, uh, this has been the last in our current series of virtual town halls, but don't panic. There will be definitely more coming up <laughs> later in the year. If there is a topic that you would love us to do a town hall about, please uh, let us know what that is. Um, we, we have some ideas of things which we're going to, to do, um, but you can always contact us through uh, Delegate Bagnell's website, which is heatherbagnell.com. And uh, there is a contact form there. So please do send us any suggestions of uh, future town halls. And of course, uh, do get involved in the process. Uh, there's um, elections happening uh, beginning tomorrow. So, uh, you know, your vote is your voice. Use your voice, speak up and help us to continue changing the narrative as we move uh, forward together. Uh, we should also recognize that here on the call, we do have a couple of fantastic community advocates, uh, Dawn Myers and also Latika Hicks. Uh, thank you for everything that you all do also um, with your various organizations. Uh, as we go forward, of course, uh, if there are things that you would like to get involved in, um, please let us know that too. And um, uh, and uh, definitely get involved with your candidates in your own districts. And if you need to find out anything more about that, you can look at the delegates website at the voter information page, uh, which is uh, the link to right on the front page there at Heather Bagnell, again, heatherbagnell.com. So thanks so much. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Tobin, for joining us and for everything that you do. And of course, Mr. Crawford, thank you for everything you do also at State Level and uh, also to Delegate Bagnell. And uh, we look forward to the next time we can join uh, forces and uh, have another educational conversation. Uh, other than that, have a great night. Take care and we'll thank see you, you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye now, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, my dear. Thank you.